Now, in this second part of the uh, lecture on negotiation, we want to expand on what in the final slide was called complications. <laughs> Things which uh, show us that it's not just about um, a game in which you can influence it wholly by your negotiating skills. And this is, the first of these is power. Agents, bargaining agents, seldom come to the table as equal players. A simple illustration of this, the first job I ever had when I was 15 years old was in a metal finishing uh, plant in Liverpool. Uh, and I went down on my first morning. I met the boss uh, in her office. She said, uh, this was in the mid-60s, um, that she was going to pay me £4.50 a week. I tried to bargain her up. She reduced it by 50 pence. And for the rest of the time, I was employed on £4 a week. You, that was a very simple um, introduction to the nature of power uh, in the employment relationship. And it was a mistake I was not to make uh, again. Now, power affects all economic relationships. Let's take one that's not about the employment relationship, the supply chain. Um, so when, particularly when businesses are making uh, contracts to do with supplying, let's say, for example, in my instance, um, suppliers and supermarkets. I'm currently with colleagues in the departments of HRM doing uh, a project, a research project, looking at uh, suppliers and supermarkets. And I could have filled three slides with comments made by suppliers on how they never get anything out of supermarkets. This is not something which will come as a surprise to many of you if you've seen the recent demonstrations by milk suppliers, for example, to supermarkets. But here's two simple uh, quotes. Some retailer's way is getting you in a room and working you about the knees with a stick and saying that's what we need you to do. This is both from managing directors of supplier firms. You're never on an equal footing. It's certainly big brother bully boy tactics. That's the way I see it. Now, this isn't about the personal predispositions of the negotiators. Objectively, supermarkets generally have more power than suppliers. Um, and they use that power in the negotiating process to drive down their own costs. I could give you, again, you know, a score of examples, but we don't have the time. Um, but economists and organization theorists develop models, for example, to... Uh, name the different types of power in that relationship. Again, I'm not going to have time to talk about them, but basically, if you're a supplier, um, if your products can be easily codified, they're not very complex, and you don't have high levels of competence, um, then you're going to have weak power in, a, in that relationship. Put that in reverse, and you might be able to get occasionally the supermarkets to do something. Now, I'm from the Department of Human Resource Management, which focuses on the employment relationship, so I want to focus a little bit more on that. The employment relationship is you as an employee selling your labor for a wage uh, or other rewards. Um, and I want to start with something notion about does an individual employee ever have power in these exchanges? Well, yes, if, like the supplier, you have very scarce uh, things which the employer wants or needs, um, the scarcity of the skills and expertise, in other words. And a good example of this is academics. Um, you may not know this, but universities get a certain amount of their uh, income from research assessment exercises. This is largely based on the research output publications of academics. If you are one of these research so-called stars who have four top publications, you can pretty much um, affect the bargaining relationship. So one thing that's happening at the moment is that uh, in academics who have 
these top publications can frequently go to their employer and say, I've got these four and, and I've just been offered a job on X. And they have to then provide you with what is known in the business as golden handcuffs, i.e. Uh, increased rewards to stop you going somewhere else. Now, the point about this uh, example is it's unusual. Most employees do not have those power resources. So in most interactions with your boss, you will lack sufficient power to influence the outcome. So for example, if you're working in a supermarket and go and ask your boss if you can have Tuesday off to go and do whatever it is, that's purely down to their discretion. You are not negotiating. You may at best be consulted. So this explains why many employees delegate bargaining to collective agents, trade unions or professional associations. And uh, those unions or professional associations act as collective agents on behalf of employees to exert um, the maximum amount of leverage that you wouldn't be able to exert purely as individuals. If we look at the ideal types of collective bargaining, and this is explained in a paper that you're going to be asked to read, so I won't go into it in too much detail, the bargaining can be integrative. In other words, it can be based on cooperation, high trust, mutual problem solving, or it can be distributive, largely based on zero-sum um, opportunism, low trust, um, defined rules, and so on. Now, the ideal of... Uh, collective bargaining is a mutual gain. That doesn't assume that you and the employer have common interests. It merely assumes you can find interests in common. Um, in other words, that an exchange in which you will both benefit from. So, the article you're going to be asked to read, I've given a very brief highlight of a couple of points here, and it's from some research that I and, again, some colleagues in the department did into... Um, one of Scotland's major industry. We won't say which one it was. Um, and this paper won some awards uh, recently because there's been very few um, observations. We were given very good access to observe the bargaining process. And I'm going to pick out just a couple of things from this to illustrate it. What the company wanted to do was to reduce its costs by restructuring working practices. And... If you read the article, what you find is they did a lot of preparation. They did risk assessments. They decided that they were not going to have, for example, any operational managers uh, in the team. Um, they very cleverly took all the bargaining agents off-site so that they couldn't go back to their working uh, groups and be put under pressure by people going, don't do that, don't do this. Um, and so they were insulated from those kind of pressures. And there's a quote here from the HR briefing document. We have the ability to transfer products to other operations in the group. We control all formal communication channels, and we have the time and resources to plan. This is telling you about power in the employment relationship. And what they did during this process is, although they kept all the union people out in the site miles from anywhere, they deliberately leaked things back um, to the employees um, uh, in a way that unions weren't able to. So the strategy, um, well, I won't go into this. We, we, we don't really have the time. I think the important point here is that what the company was prepared to do in an exchange was to trade one-off buyouts for some permanent changes. Right? So in other words, permanent changes for working practices, which would bring big efficiency gains, they were prepared to buy out. They were prepared to pay a, pr a small price for them. So people felt they were getting them. But one interesting point about this is that, if you read the article, is that the one group they couldn't do this with was engineers. Engineers have scarce skills. Right? You can't simply do what they were doing with the production operators. And I want to read one quote out, and I'm leaving out various swear words from this um, in case I'm arrested. Um, and this is what one HR director uh, said in relation to the engineers. 
We have to take them out for a drink, buy them a curry, take them home, let them make love to the wife, then wake them up with a smile and breakfast in bed. It also, it's basically showing that employers and their bargaining agents have a realistic notion of power and how much power they can exert in, in this process. So what's the other complication? It's basically culture. Business systems, whether in countries or corporations, have cultural characteristics that shape the way the agents approach or behave in negotiations. So cultures are values and institutions that frame the way that individuals or groups think and act. And I'm going to give, again, like with the employment one, one example that you can follow through yourself. Um, doing business with China. Uh, I spent 1989 working in China, and in a few years after that, went back with various delegations um, and did some negotiations. Um, and again, I could fill up a fair amount of time, which I haven't got with that. But there's a paper by a management theorist, Lockett, who identifies certain characteristics of Chinese culture, which if you didn't get before you started bargaining, you would certainly get pretty quickly once you'd started. Um, respect for age or hierarchy. I once went to a seminar, which I was asked to speak on in, in Beijing, in which in the seminar, the Chinese speakers spoke in strict hierarchical order right down from the top party official down to the lowest. There was no free exchange, um, as you would get uh, in this typical example. An orientation towards the group, a very important notion, concept of face. Now, uh, people feeling that they're being treated properly uh, is important, but there's a very high premium in some cultures on not losing face. And this is important to this. The other, and it's very important in uh, negotiations is the importance of relationships, or what the Chinese call guanxi, who you know. Um, and uh, this is much more important in terms of the dynamics of the bargaining process. Now this is also not effect, when we talk about Chinese culture, we're also not talking about you know, ancient Confucian characteristics, we're also talking about the fact that China is run is a one-party state run by the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, it's also largely a command economy run from the top um, that affects things. So, for example, these are all quotes from a PhD I examined about doing business in China, um, written by a Chinese person. It, and they're all quotes from British business people. It can be said in general that the negotiations from the Chinese side are not the final decision makers. We are prepared generally to delegate more. They are not. When you do negotiations, you frequently find that they stop, disappear out, get back on the phone or whatever it is to wherever the party boss is, and then they come back in. This, you just have to get used to it. Um, it's a strictly hierarchical system in which the negotiators very, very seldom have the power to complete the negotiation process. Another interesting point, which they sometimes call principle first, detail point second. I've got a quote here from another British business. They insisted on putting the phrase friendly cooperation and mutual benefits in the contract. Now, in Western contracts, that would not be done because it's extraneous to the business language, the formal, impersonal notions of business. Now, when putting that in reflects in part the notion of guanxi and personal relationship, but it's also a very handy tactic because when you reach a very difficult point where you do something they don't like, they can make reference points to, I thought we'd agree that it was going to be friendly cooperation. And this can really throw the Western negotiators and, and, and kind of extract concessions which they didn't expect. Another one which really caught uh, a delegation that I was on out, I think one peculiarity of the Chinese is they often make very serious points in a social occasion. And this is partly the boundaries in, with the social and, the, and, the, not, uh, and the, the business are much looser. So what you frequently find is they take you on these fantastic banquets, and then halfway through the banquet, they start negotiating. Um, and it, again, can be very, very difficult, particularly after you've consumed the very large amount of alcohol, which they've been um, uh, encouraging you to take and which they've not been drinking themselves. 
something you only notice after a few negotiations. So, conclusions. Um, skills are important, but they're not enough. Um, awareness of power resources, awareness of the cultural characteristics that people bring um, to the table. Um, so negotiators and potential negotiators need to be aware of the economic and cultural resources that frame the process they're going with. I think that for most people will not be involved in cross-cultural negotiations. Most people will be involved in ones in which there's differential amounts of power. And this really starts to frame and contextualize what you think is feasible um, in a negotiating process. And you'll get a lot out of that if you read that um, article, as I've said, uh, by Findlay et al. Uh, the, I wasn't able to talk particularly about the union side because I didn't have the time, but they also, of course, made their own preparations, even though that they knew they weren't in as powerful a situation. So the exercise that we'd like you to um, do in relation to this is to make a short summary of the piece but in doing so, try to assess the extent to which negotiator behavior is consistent with the advice given in the first part of the lecture. And this kind of links the two lectures. And actually, when you look at it, you see that it actually is a lot of the time. And so although we have to be careful that negotiations are not just a closed system game, the advice on preparation for that can be recontextualized into a situation of differential power or differential culture. Good luck.